single. There's someone out there for you. Jesus is your boyfriend now. Meet and greet's coming up. You know what to do. The key is to act like you don't care. It happens when you don't expect it. Who are you bringing to the wedding? If I was a girl, I'd date you. Who can we set you up with? Sorry, couples only. Have you tried internet dating? She looks single. You know who else wasn't married? Paul. All single ladies, all single ladies. Come on. Happens when you're not looking. Work on your smile. He's single. You know who else wasn't married? Jesus. It's okay to be a fifth wheel. Maybe if you give God one of your ribs, he'll give you a wife. You should change your Facebook profile picture. You know who else wasn't married? Matthew. No, he was married. You should meet my cousin. Just pray about it. Pray harder. This series is on marriage. You don't need to pay attention. You're not that old yet. You can't settle. You know, you might want to think about settling. There's plenty of fish in the sea. We're going to celebrate not having Valentine's Day. If she says, you're like my best friend, that's bad. You know, when you have a wife, you can't play as much Xbox. You should get a dog. Have you asked Jesus for a wife? Are you on Christian Mingle? Have you? Have you tried this? This looks good. I have a great book for you to read. It's called the Bible. Jesus is your girlfriend now. Dude, you have to get someone hot because you're going to be married to them forever. You are going to make such a cool aunt. It's not about you. You know, there's no marriage in heaven. It's all about you. I don't know. Is he a Christian? It's about Jesus. I know people who got married when they were like 70, OK? You're fine. Marriage is like a sandwich. It takes a long time. You're not gonna meet your husband at a bar. Do you wanna be Jim and Pam, or do you wanna be Ross and Rachel? For it is better to be unmarried. See? North side, or north side with four wheel drive. Um, it's good to see you guys. Uh, my name's Alan Tiger, I'm the singles thing. I don't know what I do around here. College and young adults, a lot of single people hang around me. Not in a weird way, but in a good way. Can I just tell you, I've been looking forward to this service specifically all week because I knew that like per capita, we got more singles in our third service. And I don't know what that says about you or us or whatever, but um, I'm excited. I'm excited for this. So my name's Alan Tiger. It's so awesome that you guys are here. We're in the middle of a marriage series, but this week is different. I just have to know how many married people in the room have said one or more of those things to a single person to help them. Don't lie. Get your hands up. All right. Okay. All right. So, okay, repentance, that's the next message. Um, all right, singles, let's, let's, let's get them to be honest. How many of you have heard one or more of those cliches, the Christian cliches, all right? All right, some of you may have gone the distance. My favorite one of the whole one is like, I've got a book for you to read. It's called the Bible. That's, that's, the, that's the best one. So, um, back in the early days of Facebook, um, I remember there was this feature, and I think it might still be there, but I'm not really sure, but you could change your relationship status I only say that because I don't know it's there because I haven't done it in like, well, six years. I think I haven't changed. I've changed it to married and it stayed. But um, you used to be able to, to choose from all these different things. Like I'm in a relationship. I'm in an open relationship. I'm not in a relationship. So I'm single and looking. I'm single and not looking. And there was one that was, it's complicated. Okay. And some people would just do that as like a joke just to get you to like, you know, say, oh, ha, that's really funny. You know, it's complicated. And then some people would do it really seriously, which turns social media really awkward really quickly. It's like, so it's really really complicated. Um, if I were, if you were to ask me, um, the relationship that singles and the church of America have, I would label it like that. It's, it's complicated. Um, it's complicated for the first time in American history. There's more single adults than there are married adults, but they are the demographic that's leaving the fast, the fastest through the church. Uh, I, I sent out a singles survey to, uh, to a bunch of people on Facebook. I don't know. I just sent it out. Whoever took it, took it. I had over 75 responses, some from North Side, some not. I don't know. It was anonymous, so I don't know really where they all came from. I didn't ask, like, where they were from. So it could have been from anywhere. But, but the statistics are pretty, uh, pretty close to the nationwide surveys that I've seen. The first question I asked was, what is, um, what is your involvement in your church? Okay. What is your involvement in your church? Um, over half of the people who took the survey, so 75 people took the survey, over half of them said that it was a seven or above, okay? So we're not talking about people who just occasionally go to church. We're talking about people who are in church, who are serving in ministries, who are in, involved. They would call themselves highly involved in their church from seven to 10 on a scale of one to 10. The second question that I asked was, was this, how do you think your church is doing with singles? Which is a vulnerable question for me because if it's a bad answer, that's my job. <laughs> and it was a bad answer. Over 90% of the people who took the survey rated six or lower 
on a scale of 1 to 10. Six or lower. Now, that's convicting to me um, because it's the realm that I kind of live in, in the ministry world, uh, for singles and young adults and college students. But it should be convicting as a church as well that this demographic has become the hardest to reach as a church. And most churches, a lot of churches, could really care less. Um, so I wanted to just lay it all out on the table this morning for singles. So I, I, I grabbed a hold of, when we were planning out the marriage series, I said, I want Valentine's Day. Um, and they're like, oh, that's going to be a great marriage series. You know, Valentine's Day falls right in there. I was like, no, we're going to do singles on Valentine's Day, right? Um, because you married couples already got plans and lunch dates and all that sort of stuff. And all the single ladies, right? Um, everybody in here is just like, what am I going to do today? Well, you're going to learn something. So, um, so here we go. I just want to lay it out. So we're doing this series uh, from this day forward, obviously a marriage series. But what I want to tell you single people is that throughout this series, um, there are going to be things that you're going to want to grab a hold of, to put in your back pocket and to hold on to. You know, the Holy Spirit has a way of recalling those sort of things that you have learned, that you have set under, um, that you have set under the teaching of Scripture and that. And even if it isn't immediately applicable to you today, Or like you listened to last week's sermon and you were like, I just, you know, I was hoping that it would be something for me. Well, it was for you, just maybe not now. So hang on to that. Bookmark the site on the website. Bookmark where we have all of our sermons. Get a copy of this series. Um, you know, get your, get your CD copy. However you want to get it. There's, there's ways you can get it. Podcast it on iTunes. But hang on to this because there's going to be some things in this series that you're going to want to hold on to. Um, But I say this to married people today, married people, parents, um, you need today just as much as the singles need today. Okay. We're going to talk to singles and about singles today. Um, but we're going to talk about them like they're in the room, not like they're, you know, second class citizens or something, but we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that. But here, if you're, if you're a parent or if you have, um, if you have grandchildren or who are, who are starting to, you know, get in that in the the dating, trying to figure out what they're doing in their life. If you have single people in your life, and I really hope that you do, that you want to see them have uh, godly, Christian, thriving marriages, which as a church we should all be for, not not for marriage, like let's just get them all married and it'll be fine, but as a church we should be for each other, whether single or married or divorced or widowed, we're in this together. So I want to tell you uh, married people, that things in our culture are rapidly changing. People meet differently. They connect differently. They date differently. And uh, it's not a bad thing, but the same old Christian cliches that we use over and over again, those are bad things. Um, those aren't working anymore. So a lot of the things that we're kind of joking about on, on the video there, a lot of people use that as actual advice. Um, and so what I want to do today is just kind of clear the air a little bit. Um, you know, we're going to understand that it's complicated and it's a little funky when it comes to Christians and, and, uh, and singles in the church. And, uh, I, I want to just, I want to just lay it out. So we're going to learn this together. So here's what I want to do. I want to do three reasons why I believe that the church and the singles relationship is complicated. This will, this will pull out some of our own weaknesses. This will pull out some of, some of the things that we can do better. So here's number one. Here's number one. We treat the gift, that is the gift of singleness, we treat the gift like a curse. All right, how many single people, we're going to be honest in this service because there's a lot of you. How many single people have ever felt like you were, no, let's not do that. Um, I should just have all the single people stand up. That's what I told them in second service. They're going to have all the single people stand up and like partner up and we'll just fix this, you know. That's not what we're here for, right? If you brought a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you're single and you're familiar with the Bible, um, you might know that 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is the only chapter in Scripture that specifically says anything to singles. It says it directly to them. Paul was single, and he says, by the way, I want to give you these tips, all right? He doesn't give commands, but he gives some tips. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 7, here's what Paul says. Starting in verse 6 and 6 and 7, he says, Now, as a concession, not a command. That's really important. So this is not from Jesus, who was also single. This is not direct command from God. This is not even, um, you know, this is the inspired word of God. But he's just saying, here's a tip for you, okay? Here's a tip. Here's what I've learned. He says, as a concession, not as a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am. So he's saying, I wish that you guys were like me, which is what? Single, right. I wish that you were like I myself am, but each of you has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. So first and foremost, 
He calls it a gift. He calls the gift of singleness a gift. So, so Paul's here just giving out gifts to everyone. It's like Oprah. And he's like, you get a gift and you get a gift. But, but, but what we tend to do is we take the gift of marriage and we elevate it. We take that gift of marriage and we, we put it up on this pedestal and we say, this is, this is the goal. And if you're single, there's something wrong with you and you need to get to the goal. You need to get married because then we know what to do with you, right? We have married groups and we have married series and we have this. So, so what we tend is we elevate that and then we devalue the gift. Paul calls it a gift, the same gift. As a matter of fact, he'd elevate it above marriage later in the scripture. But, but he says he, we devalue the gift of, of singleness and it is a gift. So how do we do a better job? How do we do a better job of valuing the gift of singleness? Single people need to hear this. Married people need to hear this. I need to do a better job of valuing you as a citizen of the kingdom of God. So it starts by this. Treating all of our singles, college students, young adults, uh, widowed, divorced, all of our singles, like full-fledged members of the kingdom. You see, singles don't believe that their singleness is a gift because we, have a, we as a church don't do a good job reminding them. We don't do a good job reminding them. We give them the puppy dog eyes like, oh, you're still single. We can work on that. You know, like, have you met my cousin? Like, we do things like that. But, but we don't see that as a gift. Paul says it's a gift. Here's the reasons he says it's a gift. Okay? Look to, uh, look to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Jump down to verse 26. Here's what he says. He says, I think in view of the present distress, what he's saying is like, like, Everyone in the Corinthians church is like sleeping around with each other. It's like this really big deal. It's, a, it's a, a, you know, uh, marriages are falling apart. So he's got a lot of teaching on marriage to the Corinthian church. But here's what he says. There's distress. So he's going to say, don't, don't rush into this. He says, in view of the present distress, it is good for, one person, for a person to remain as he is. If you're married, stay married. If you're single, it might be better off for you to stay single. He said, are you bound to a wife? Do you seek to be free? Are you free from a wife? Do you seek a wife? But if you marry, you have not sinned. Okay. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. So a single woman marries, she has not sinned yet. This is the key verse here. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. Hold your amens. And I will spare you. I would spare you of that. Those who marry will have worldly troubles. Paul first says that the gift of singleness offers you freedom from the problems of marriage. In the first service, I said freedom from the problem of marriage. And I got some looks. Um, the problems of marriage, okay? It's, it's very different. Know, th- know this, singles. If you, are, if you are single and in this room right now, you may feel like you're being punished by God. But you may actually be being protected by God. You may be protected by God. You see, um, God is a father who gives good gifts. Scripture tells us he's not going to give us bad gifts. So so the gift that you have is a good gift. And the gift that you have right now is the freedom from 100% of the marriage problems that are in this room. Okay? Every single marriage in this room has problems. Okay? And if you don't, you don't have to come to the rest of the service. You know, the rest of the series will be fine. But every single one. Now, I've got to be really careful because my wife's in this service. So, um... We're going to get through this point quick. With singles, if you don't see your singleness as a gift, I want you to take a, take a field trip to the airport, okay? And I want you to watch couples carry their luggage into the airport, okay? Because when I was single, I could grab a backpack and be gone for two weeks, right? Because you're just like, deodorant, eh, whatever. I, I need like maybe underwear and maybe, you know, some suntan lotion. You know, like that's what it was like. I'm good. I can wear what I'm at. It's going to be fine. So I just go. But, but when I got married, okay, you find this out on the honeymoon. It's like you're packing for the honeymoon. Um, somehow I gained a curling iron and a straightener, which blows my mind why you need both of those things. But I think they cancel. They should cancel each other out. That's like free way. Like we should throw those out. So you don't, you curl it and then you straighten it or then you straighten it. And you curl. Anyway, anyway, that's, that might be a whole nother sermon. Um, but, but go and watch them because what you're going to see is you're going to see like the guy is carrying a much bigger bag than he really needs. Okay. And that's not because he's just being a nice guy. It's because somewhere along the way, maybe there in the concourse, he has been told you're taking this stuff. Okay. The makeup bag is going in yours. We're going to do this, you know, this kind of dance. So this is what Paul is saying, right? Paul never had to pack a curling iron. Okay. That's not exactly what he's saying, but, um, 
Paul didn't have to get his wife's check back. What he's saying is, is, is when, when you join with another person, Scripture says the two become one. A, a man will leave his father and he, he will cling to his wife. Now, when that happens, they bring baggage. They bring a lot of bags. Okay? And so you've got emotional and spiritual and physical baggage that comes into a marriage. And Paul's saying, all those problems that come up, you know, Wayne talked last week about the honeymoon phase, and it's like everything's great, and then the problems come up. All those problems. He's like, as single, you don't, you don't have to worry about that as single. Paul's like, I wish you were like me, because I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Secondly, um, if you look to verse 32, Paul says that the gift of singleness offers freedom of complete devotion to God. Freedom of complete devotion to God. Starting in verse 32, he says this. I want you to be free from anxiety. This is for everybody. Everybody, I want you to all be free from anxiety. So what he's going to say is I'm going to give you some tips to lower your level of anxiety. He said, the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife and his interests are divided. So you tell me which anxiety is better, to be anxious about the things of the Lord or to please your wife. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about the worldly things, how to please her husband. Now don't, don't leave this part out because some of you may have read read like, please your husband. That's the goal of marriage. And be like, I'm out. Don't miss this part. I say this for you. I say this for your own benefit. Not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Now, I'm pretty guilty of talking about my small group like every time I preach. And uh, most of them are sitting on a row up here. So um, I'm going to look over. But we have a great small group. We have single people in our small group. If you have a boring small group, get some single people in it. All right? Because it will be like, you did what this week? Like, there's no way. So... um, when we talk about undivided devotion, like being able to do that, last week, we're talking to some guys in my small group. And we're talking about going to a concert. We're talking like screamo concert. Wives are definitely not interested in coming to this. Like, like screaming, loud music, all that sort of stuff. And from across the room, I make eye contact with my wife and she gives me, married people will know what this is, the look. Okay? You guys know, right? Single people are just like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what the look is. Because if you're single, you don't get the look. Okay? The look is a conversation without any words. Okay? The look is, is being able to say a thousand words without anything. Sometimes you don't even have to move your face. Like, I couldn't do the look. Like, I can't do the look. I'm not capable of it. But I could probably draw it because I see it, like, constantly. So, um, because here's what I do. I come up with all of these grand plans. And then I look to Bree. And she's like, no. Nah, you know what? You know what that means? I'm not going to that concert, okay? If you're single, you're going to concerts, right? <laughs> if you're single... You can do whatever you want. We've got kind of a joke in our, in, in our group, the hashtag single life. Like we'll be talking about, well, we really can't because we got it. It's all married, 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 married stuff. And the two girls in the corner just laughing like, I can do whatever I want because I'm single. And that's kind of a silly example. That's about kind of, you know, some, some worldly things, although it's going to be a great concert. I wish I could go. But it brings out a stinging truth. A single person, you, have a complete, you can have a complete devotion to God. When you stand at a marriage altar and you say those vows, it usually includes something like from this day forward until death do us part. You know, before I got married, I I worked a job where I could work 80 to 90 hours a week. I was was working at a campus ministry and I could meet with guys on campus or at Taco Bell at like one in the morning. Okay. If I tried to do that now, okay, I'm not saying that my only problem would be, would be Brie. My my one problem would be staying awake. Um, but, but the other problem would be like, I just can't go and do those sort of things anymore. I just, I just can't do that because we are together. So if I'm going to go on a mission trip, I'm probably, I'm probably likely to go with my wife if I'm going to go. And so it's, it's this undivided devotion to the Lord, this, this unhindered way. And Paul says that, that when you get married, your priorities have to be divided. That's what this series is going to be about. Your number one priority is no longer you. It's got to be divided. Paul says, Paul says the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, but the married man is to be anxious about that and his relationship with his wife. So singles, I put a few bullet points there in your, um, in your, in your bulletins if you want to write down some action steps. Number one is don't waste your freedom. Don't waste your freedom. I mean, every single married guy in this room has thought, man, I wish I would have insert this in the blank when I was single. Now, not all those are the most holy things in the world, but you get the point. 
Go on a mission trip while you got the time. When you don't have to ask anybody permission. No permission to mission. That, all right, we could work on that, yeah. Bonus. Um, you can learn a lot about a person on a mission trip. You can meet single people on a mission trip. All right? So I'm just, that's just, I'm just throwing that one in there. Um, get involved. Be a part of the family. Sign up for a small group. Even if you think it's just old married people, sign up. Okay? Liven their lives up a little bit. Single uh, married people, parents, grandparents. Don't treat single people like second class citizens. Paul would say that they actually have a better gift than you because they have a, a, a streamlined purpose. Don't pity them. Don't pity them. The, the survey actually alluded to that they don't really like the puppy dog eyes when you tell them. They don't want you to fix them. They're not broken. They're gifted. They're single. Lastly, invite singles into your life. Invite them to your small group. Include them as part of the body. It's like we treat single people like they bite sometimes. You know, like a, they're going to give us some sort of single disease. It's not contagious. Like, have your marriage and hang out with single people. It's okay. Invite them over for dinner. You know, think about today. Today is uh, Valentine's Day. A lot of you maybe have like lunch plans or something like that. Grab you a third wheel. That'd be fun, right? It'd be fun. They're all up here. Number two. Number two, we treat the search, as in the search for the future spouse, we treat the search like the lottery, okay? We treat the search like the lottery. Here's what I mean. Think back a couple weeks ago when the, or a few weeks back when the mega millions lottery was just causing everybody to go crazy. You know, people that I've heard say, I will never buy a lottery ticket. That's from the devil. They're like, well, two or three won't hurt, right? Like people are just going nuts because they're, they're like, what if, you know, what if? And you know how awful the odds are when it comes to the lottery and more and more people bought and the, you know, the, the odds went down even more. I'm not sure how that worked, but, um, so you had all this money, I think $1.6 billion is what it made it up to. I didn't even get, you know, I didn't follow it and see who won or anything like that because, um, you know, it it was kind of strange because like all of, all of social media and everything was talking about water cooler talk and all that. It's talking about the lottery. I feel like the little glimpse that I can get of dating in 2016 is like the lottery. Okay. I feel, I feel like it's like that. Uh, The odds are never in your favor. The chances are slim, but millions of people are going to play anyway. I was reading a book called uh, Modern Romance. If you're a Parks and Rec fan, um, Tom from Parks and Rec wrote this book. I don't know his real name, so uh, we'll call him Tom. Anyway, um, Tom wrote this book. And it was, uh, it's, it's a book called Modern Romance. I don't recommend it, <laughs> but uh, it freaked me out, actually, because I'm, I'm, I'm reading through this book. Imagine it with a title, Modern Romance, and I, my mind was just blown. And I was just blown of how different dating is now. Now, I went to Bible college, so dating was just like... You know, like pick one, you know, like it was like that. And eventually, you know, it just, it just happened so fast. And, um, but, but, but think about the dating scene when you met your spouse. And so I, I was reading through this stuff. He's got a whole chapter in there on text messages. Okay. Just how texting had, has changed the game of dating or has changed, you know, every, it's changed, it's changed everything, just texting. And so like, if you, if you wait too long to text someone back after a date or after you first met, like they probably don't like you. It's probably not going to work out because they, they took too long. Or you're a really bad texter, which I think is worse today um, if you don't know how to, you know, get around a phone. So um, secondly, if you text back too quickly, you might look too anxious. This is just stuff that I learned in one chapter. You might look too anxious. Don't look too anxious. You've got to find that like fine line of waiting long enough so you don't look anxious, but not seeming, you know, not, not taking too long. So, uh, and then, oh, there was like emojis, all this sort of stuff. Oh yeah, if you, um, if you, if you have bad grammar or punctuation, that you're obviously just a complete idiot and you should never talk to that person again, okay? If you have really good grammar and your sentences are all like perfect, you're probably a psychopath um, or a school teacher. That one can go either way, really. So um, it's one of those. So I'm just learning all this. I'm just going page by page. I'm just blown away. It's like if I was born 20 years later, I'd be single for the rest of my life. There's just no way I'm getting back into that. I don't even think I had a smartphone when, when Bree and I were dating. So, um, but, but, but what, I, what I've seen is like we turn this into this like huge deal. Like we take marriage and we set it up on this pedestal. Like it's $1.6 billion, right? And you might... Might, 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 might have a chance at it. You have a very slim chance. But if you find the one, if you get lucky, if you buy the right ticket. And so what I wanted, wanted to say this morning, it's, 
you can rig the system in your favor. If, if I were to tell you this morning, you can rig the system in your favor. Uh, you know, singles, I want you to write these two books down, actually, because I'm not going to be able to spend a ton of time in this point, especially on, you know, like the how to date and all that sort of stuff. But I want to point you to two resources that could really, really help you out if you haven't already read them. The first one is, uh, is called The Sacred Search by Gary Thomas. The Sacred Search by Gary Thomas. Um, that book is, um, it, it will seem maybe a little churchy to you for people who've been around the church, or maybe if you're not uh, from around the church, you, you will read this book and you'll hear a lot of like, you know, churchy maybe talk. It's a little more on that side, but just some great, great insight on that search for the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. The second one is not going to feel very churchy, um, but it's uh, New Rules for Love, Sex, and Dating by Andy Stanley. Um, if you haven't heard it, you can actually, you can actually podcast that. I think maybe you can get some, uh, you can get some resources on that, but, but you can also buy the book, um, new rules for love, sex and dating by Andy Stanley. I'll talk about that here in just a little bit as well. Um, some great points that he gets. So here's what I want to give you. That being said, um, let me give you a formula. Just, just two really quick things that you can re- remember as you're navigating the dating scene of 2016. Okay. Here's the first one. Don't divide before you add. I don't know if that's like a mathematically correct or whatever, but I'm going to say that it is. So don't divide before you add. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, we, we yell this at single people all the time because they want to date non-Christians. Um, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Paul is saying, don't on the very in, most important thing of your life be divided. If you go into a marriage... The top three reasons for divorce in America right now are money, religion, and sex. Okay? That's a pretty good place to start. Let's agree on these three things. Let's agree on these boundaries with money, religion, and sex. I'm not going to to, to go into a marriage divided on those things. Okay? And so uh, Deborah Flita, she's the author of the author of uh, true love dates. She's got a blog and all that. And I, I can't even recommend all that stuff, but she had this quote in an article that I read. Um, if you're a believer and profess to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, there's no getting around the fact that this is by far the most influential relationship you will ever have. It is a relationship that will shape your identity, form your beliefs, influence your choices and guide the entire purpose of your life. Don't divide before you add. Don't divide the entire purpose of your life by bringing someone in, by adding someone into your life that doesn't share them with you. It's pretty simple to cross those off the list. If you're divided on the biggest issues in your life, don't add. So here's number two. Don't subtract before you add. Don't subtract before you add. Meaning don't, don't start to give away things about you that, you, that are core to you. That are, um, that, are, that, are, that are true to you, that are, that are about you, your, your identity, your, you know, the, the, your purity, those things. Don't, don't give those things away before you add somebody or in order to add someone to your life. Paul continues in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, go out of their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you, sh- and, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, a lot of people would read this, especially people not familiar um, with the church or whatever, and they haven't heard that verse a hundred times. And you hear that, you know, don't be unequally yoked and go away from the people that will defile you and then I'll accept you. And it seems like God is, is performing some sort of like, like Christian racism, you know, like he's just saying, he's saying like, if, if you don't, marry this way, or if you don't act this way, if you don't set yourself up in this way, then I won't accept you. Well, here's, here's the truth of the matter is that God calls his people and his children to a higher standard, just like many parents in this room call their children to a higher standard. You know, you don't act like all of your friends. You act like we act in our family. You act by these values, these morals, these boundaries. But what often happens is that Christian singles look for a relationship so hard that they start to subtract things that are core to them. They start to subtract the boundaries and the values and the morals. You see, girls, you'll get desperate. You'll get desperate and you'll start to believe the lies that, that your biological clock is ticking or that, you know, you need, to have, you need to be married before a certain age and you'll buy into culture, you'll buy into lies and you'll start to believe that you need to hurry and find someone. This is kind of the lottery talk again. You've got to hurry. You've got to get your ticket. And so instead of looking for someone who, who you would love to be married to, instead of looking for the person of your dreams, instead of looking for your 
culturally called the soulmate, you'll look for the first person to smile at you. The first person to pay you any kind of attention. And then you'll end up dating, possibly married, maybe even have a family with someone that you're not compatible with. Because you subtracted things. You subtracted values and morals. Guys, you will hear the whisper of the devil that you need physical satisfaction now. And a lot of you won't even try to date. A lot of you won't even try to get it and pursue a woman. A lot of you won't even go that way. But you will, you will, you will pursue it on the internet. And then you'll think, my wife just needs to show up and be what I've seen on the internet. And so you'll, you, you won't look for a girl who loves you more or loves Jesus more than she loves you. You're going to find the first person that meet, meets your superficial standards and you're going to marry them. And you're going to be unhappy. You're going to be unfulfilled because you subtracted before you added. Now, all, now, these two things fit into the modern day dating scene. But instead of acting crazy and going out and just being like, I'm just playing the lottery. I hope I find Mr. Right or I hope I find the girl of my dreams. You're, you're taking your time. You're being patient. It's okay to take your time. You're sticking to your values and morals. And the search for your future spouse will be a godly search. And it won't look like a crapshoot or a lottery ticket. So, one more reason. One more reason why I think singles in the church that our relationship is complicated. is because we treat a myth, or we treat the myth like it's the truth. We treat the myth like it's the truth. Here's what I mean by that. As a culture... We've convinced ourselves that when you find that special someone, when you find your soulmate, when you find happily ever after, when you find your Disney prince or princess, that, that then they will come in and Jerry Maguire said, you complete me. You know, you came in and you filled in all of the holes. You, you met me where all of my weaknesses were and you filled in all those. And you, you hear couples just say, you know, like, oh, we just balance each other out. It's a myth. It's a myth. The myth is that you need to find the right person to make you the right person. But the the opposite is the truth. You need to become the right person in order to find the right person. The search for a spouse starts with you. It starts with becoming someone, understanding that what God wants from you and pursuing that. Andy Stanley says in his series, The New Rules for Love, Sex, and Dating. He says it this way. Are you who the person you're looking for is looking for? Think about that statement there. You know, we, tell our, we tell our culture, we tell our kids that, you know, you need to go find the perfect match. You need to go find this perfect, mark the stuff off of your list until you find the perfect guy or find the perfect girl. Are you, are you who the person you're looking for is looking for? He illustrates it with the story of a girl who goes off to college. She, she had a great church upbringing. Her parents were highly invested in her spiritual growth. She had a great youth group experience, and then she went off to college. She didn't get involved in a church. She didn't get plugged in to any sort of Christian community. As a matter of fact, she picked up friends of the exact opposite morals and nature. And she started going to parties. She started, her life was downward spiraling. She was drinking every night. She was sleeping with whoever would smile at her. She was, uh, she, she was in a bad place. She barely, barely got the grades to get through college. She got her diploma and then she had to move back home because she wasn't interested in looking for a job during school. She didn't do an internship, didn't do anything like that. She was only focused on her life and having the time of her life. And she goes back home and moves in with her parents. And uh, she starts to get plugged back into the church. It's really a redemption story that starts to swing back up and she starts to get Christian community and she's got mentors in her life and she's got people that love her, but she is still carrying all of this baggage of the four years that she spent at this university. All the things of herself that she had given away and all of the hurt and pain that still weighs on her mind. But things are getting better. And she goes out to a, to a party. I don't know, it's probably a Super Bowl party where the Broncos won or something like that. I mean, almost made it. She goes out to a party. It's a Christian party. It's a lot of Christian friends that she's met from church. And she goes um, and, and she meets this guy. She sees him. You know, it's like beam of light. He comes, you know, through the door. And she's just like, he's so gorgeous. He's perfect. And as she kind of like stalks him through the night. I know you do it. Um, she comes, kind of stalks him through the night. She kind of watches him and how he interacts with other people. He's kind. He's gentle. He's loving. He is the perfect Christian guy. He's going to come. And, and so she starts like planning her wedding. And she starts, she hasn't even talked to the guy yet. But she starts planning her wedding. She starts, you know, getting so excited. She's like, this is it. I'm going to meet this guy. And everything's going to be fine. All of the hurt and all the pain and everything that I've been through is going to be okay because I found the one. And so she comes home 
And she sits with her mom cross-legged there on the living room floor and she starts telling her all of the wonderful things about this guy and how great he is and how he is the one and he's got to be the one and my life is about to, to take a, you know, it's just about to rock, a rocket ride. Things are going to get so much better. And her mom isn't smiling. Her mom isn't giggling anymore. Her mom just kind of looks at her stone face and she says this. She says, honey, that's great. I'm glad that you, that you met someone and that your standards are that high. But a guy like that isn't looking for a girl like you. And that seems so very harsh for a mom to say to a daughter. But for a daughter who was emotionally and physically and spiritually full of holes. Going out and searching for the guy to fill all of those pieces in her. Her mom didn't want to set her up for failure. She said, a a guy like that's not looking for a guy like you. You see, the point of this time in your life, singles, the point of the gift that you have been giving is not to find the right person, but to become the right person. Are you who the person you're looking for is looking for? Because you could walk into this lobby today and you could see the person of your dreams, but you wouldn't be ready to meet them. Now, I'm not saying that if you start to do this and if you start to apply these things to your life, that automatically God's just going to put someone in your life. But I can tell you that if he does, you'll be ready to meet him. Pursue Christ more than a husband. Pursue godliness more than a wife. I want to give just a a challenge to singles. And actually, this is going to be a challenge for us all. But first to singles. We did this thing in our youth group where our youth minister had all of the girls take uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and write it down on a piece of notebook paper. And in every, you know, in every uh, place where the word love was, he said, I want you to write your boyfriend's name in there, right? And all the boys are like, oh, crap. You know, like, this did not end well for the guys, okay? A lot of guys got dumped that night because they're like, he's not even close. He didn't even make it past the first one, you know? And that, that seems to be a way, you know, a lot of girls growing up, they made a list of all the values and virtues and things that they wanted or even superficial things that they wanted in, in their husband. But what I want to challenge you to do is, is flip that notion, is to flip the myth and understand the truth. That it's about becoming someone, not about finding someone. So take 1 Corinthians chapter 13, write it out, and in everywhere you see the word love, put your name there. That would be pretty convicting. Let the scripture read you. This is your list. That's what you need to become to be the person that you're looking for, is looking for. It will point out your weaknesses. It will point out where Christ needs to work on you. And you're like, I just need to get married. And you're going to look at this and you're going to go, I've actually got quite a bit of stuff I need to work on. So let's broaden the challenge to everyone. Married couples in the room. If you aren't satisfied with your marriage or satisfied with your mate, the goal is not to find another mate. It's to become a different person. It's to become a better person. It's not finding someone better, but becoming someone better. The first step in dating and in marriage is to work on the problem of yourself. To become more and more like what Jesus would have you be like. So for all of us, at some point today, maybe, maybe it's later This afternoon, maybe it's this week, maybe it's on your Valentine's date, whenever that is, or if you're by yourself during that, you can write out 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and everywhere you see love, write your name. I tried to do this this week in my office. I failed. (laughs) Alan is patient, sometimes. Alan is kind. No. Alan is not boastful. All right, I quit. It's very convicting. It's a very convicting exercise to do. I'd highly recommend. So that next time, even next time you're at a wedding and you hear that read, think, am I becoming more of these things? Am I using this time in my life to become that? You know, we we transition into communion every single week, right? Right as the sermon is over. And this one's pretty easy transition. So if you're one one of our communion servers, you can go ahead and go get in place, ready to serve. This is a pretty easy transition because becoming the one you're looking for is looking for or becoming a better spouse or becoming, turning the focus back on you. Really, really, this is what communion time is for. The focus is Christ, but it's to look at yourself. It's it's a time of self-examination. 
Where are the spiritual holes? Where are the cracks and crevices in my life that only the blood of Jesus and only the broken body of Jesus can heal and fix? So when we take communion, you think of those things. You, you reflect on yourself. I'm not very patient. I'm not very kind. I'm not the things that Jesus could come and pass with 100% flying colors. He is that way. If you're not a baptized believer, you're on a journey towards God, it's okay if this, this kind of weirds you out or it's kind of awkward for you. It's okay to let the trace pass. And we understand that everybody's on a journey towards God, even those who say, I'm a Christian. We're on a journey towards God every single day. If you don't feel comfortable with taking communion today, that's totally fine. We're going to do this for the body as we self-examine. As we examine ourselves and we look to the holes and the crevices and the cracks that only Jesus can fill only Jesus can pay the price that only Jesus can make complete if you're searching for it in anything else whether it's your spouse or a mate or somebody future that may come into your life and fix everything you'll be disappointed every single time let's pray Heavenly Father as we take communion this morning we remember the body and the blood and we also remember our sin and the weight of that sin that sent Jesus to the cross Father, we not only come in reflection and self-evaluation, but we come in celebration, knowing that you gave your son, who gave his life, so that we could be made complete. There's nothing else that can do it. There's nothing else that can satisfy. Father, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with conviction and prompt us to holiness. In Jesus' name we pray.